Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, where we talk about science and all the things that make science... Starting off the news this week, a very interesting pair of studies published in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics have identified four separate classes of planetary system architecture, what they call a novel and model-independent framework for studying the architecture of exoplanetary systems as a whole. They have created four separate classes, similar, mixed, anti-ordered, and ordered. The researchers essentially delved deeper into the already known ideas surrounding the expected layout of planetary systems. In doing so, they found these four classes. Our own solar system is classed as an ordered planetary system, a system where the mass of the planets tends to increase as you get further away from the star. The opposite of this would of course be an anti-ordered system. The mixed system is when the mass and order of the planets seem extremely varied, and a similar planetary system is when the masses of neighbouring planets are very similar to one another and so there is no large disparity in mass. This research is a massive step in studying exoplanetary systems and, as the authors have said, it will be very interesting to see if the models hold up when predictions become testable. In other news, I'm just going to quickly mention that SpaceX's Super Heavy Booster prototype, which will be the most powerful operational rocket ever launched, had a static fire engine test this week. All but two engines of the launch vehicle were lit in what is a big step for the company's Starship program, which could see an incredibly versatile rocket start orbital testing in the next few months. And finally from me this week, a study published in the journal Nature has looked closer at the rapidly melting Thwaites Glacier, a colossal area that is roughly the size of Britain. If this glacier completely melted, then global sea levels would rise by half a metre. Much of the data gathering was done by the US-built IceFin robot, a device that allowed a detailed and extensive amount of data gathering on the glacier. Thwaites Glacier is currently responsible for 15% of ice discharge from the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, and is generally a very influential glacier both because of its position and size. The study was able to find out a more accurate mapping and shaping of the glacier, which in turn may help us more accurately predict the future of this glacier and help us better understand the effects that warming global temperatures can have on glaciers under the surface. The results were not entirely expected. The team saw cracks and weak spots in somewhat surprising places and realized that warm water was getting into weaker areas and making them even weaker still. It is this kind of information that can be put into predictive models to help scientists understand how and when the ice shelf is going to break down next. And now over to Ben, with lots of exciting paleontology news. Thanks, Doug. First up in the paleontology news this week is a remarkable new paper describing an amazing fossil bone bed of an animal called Aetosaurus. Aetosaurs are a grouping of pseudosuchians, related to the ancestors of living crocodilians, that only existed during the late Triassic period, looked incredibly bizarre with their upturned snouts, and were all either omnivorous or herbivorous. Well, there's an absolutely amazing fossil assemblage of the genus Aetosaurus that was discovered in southern Germany and first published on back in 1877 that contains 24 individuals all preserved together. All these individuals are between 20 and 82 centimetres in body length, and this new research has looked at the growth of the humeri in one of the smallest and one of the largest specimens from this assemblage. What they found was that both were very young juveniles, less than a year old, and apparently also had hatchling bone tissue. What this seems to suggest is that young aetosaurs were gregarious animals, meaning they formed groups, likely to deter predators and enhance their chances of survival, the first time that gregariousness has been recognised among aetosaurs. An amazing discovery then, and an even more amazing fossil, with all those juveniles preserved together like that. Also this week is the fantastic news that the largest penguin ever may have just been found. A new paper has just been published that describes nine new penguin fossil specimens from the late Paleocene of South Island, New Zealand, dating to between 59.5 and 55.5 million years ago. The largest of these specimens, comprising a complete neck vertebra, part of the pectoral girdle, nearly complete humerus, part of a hind limb and both kneecaps, has been named as a new species, Kumi Manu Fordicei. The Kumi Manu genus itself was already named back in 2017, 
but this new species is potentially even larger than the other known species, therefore putting it in the running for the biggest penguin ever, at a mass of between 148 and nearly 160 kilograms. Another new species is named in this paper, based on five of the specimens, Petrodiptes stonehousei, which would have been slightly bigger than an emperor penguin. And then there are also reported fragments of a smaller but unnamed new penguin species too. Interestingly, Kumimanu fordicei is recovered in a position close to the root of the penguin evolutionary tree, and since it lived in the Paleocene, not long after the non-avian dinosaurs were wiped out, it suggests that penguins very early on in their evolution reached the upper size limit for their body plan, speculated by the authors as being due to these animals evolving more efficient thermoregulation and therefore being able to look for food in colder and deeper waters. In addition to allowing access to larger prey items, and possibly also helping them to disperse further across the southern oceans. And finally for this week, it's what you've all been waiting for, Spinosaur brains. Researchers have, for the first time, reconstructed the brain anatomy of Baryonychine spinosaurs, that is, the spinosaurs more closely related to Baryonyx than to Spinosaurus. The brain anatomy of the genus Irritator has already been investigated, however it's a Spinosaurine, not a Baryonychine. And so this new research looks at how this lineage differed in brain morphology. Using micro CT scanning techniques, they recreated the brain endocasts of Baryonyx and Ceratosuchops, both from the Wealdon supergroup of southern England, and the oldest spinosaurs known for which brain case material has been recovered. Very interestingly, the overall anatomy of these dinosaurs' brains were actually pretty similar to the brains of other relatively basal groups of theropod dinosaurs which is consistent with other studies suggesting that basal theropods had quite conservative endocranial anatomy. Other points of interest are that these baryonychines had quite unexceptional smelling capabilities, with not particularly well-developed olfactory bulbs, and that they had hearing that was able to detect low-frequency sounds. Compared to Irritator, the area of the brain associated with gaze stabilization, the flocular lobe, is different in its overall morphology, and the authors tentatively suggest that this could mean baryonychines had less developed gaze stabilization than the spinosaurines. All of this seems to indicate then, that although the spinosaurids had very specialized skulls and lifestyles compared to other theropod dinosaurs, this initial transition towards semi-aquatic habits didn't require a massive change to the brain or sensory systems of these dinosaurs. In fact, they remained mostly the same. So that's very interesting to think about when considering the evolution of these dinosaurs, and how they managed to turn into spectacular aquatic generalists from fully terrestrial ancestors. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next week.